everyone. It's Heather Mikesell with Well-Defined. Thanks so much for joining us for our Well-Defined book club. Um, today, we're here with Dr. Bill Rawls from the author of The Cellular um, Wellness Solution. Um, so excited to talk herbs today. Um, welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Just to give everyone a little bit of background on your um, your bio. Um, so for more than 30 years, Dr. Rolls has dedicated his life to medicine. Um, but when confronted with his own health issues, he basically started exploring the world of herbs. So I'm going to let um, Dr. Rawls tell you us a little bit about how he, he basically came to become involved in studying herbs and sharing sharing um, their many benefits. Yeah, it's it's not a typical journey. You know, there aren't that many physicians, even physicians um, practicing more alternative or functional medicine or integrative medicine that really know about herbs. And that's something that I have a mission to change because I think the herbs are so important. Um, I didn't go to medical school to learn about herbal therapy. You know, I went to medical school to learn how to treat people for illness. And um, along that journey, just even in medical school, I saw that drugs had a really important purpose along with with surgery for relieving symptoms, stabilizing uh, a bad situation. But when it came to managing a chronic illness, people just weren't typically getting well. And that was an incentive for me to go into obstetrics and gynecology, uh, generally a well population um, that are, you know, the interventions mostly were people got well afterwards. And, you know, it was really just cool delivering babies. The downside of that is I practiced in a small town where I was doing night call. Um, every second to third night, every second to third weekend. And typically, you know, three or four nights a week, every week, I would be up most of the night. And this went on for 15 or 20 years. Um, and finally, my health just crashed. You know, you just, you know, there's this thing back in the 80s and 90s that was really questioning whether we needed sleep. And I bought into it. It's like, yeah, I can get by on four or five hours of sleep. I can do this. And I could when I was in my 30s, but as I went into my 40s, it just didn't work anymore. And my whole body started breaking down. And first I identified with fibromyalgia. Later I found that I was carrying some of the microbes with of Lyme disease, not from an acute tick bite. Probably picked them up when I was a kid. They had been dormant in my system. And you know, so, you know, once, but once you arrive at that diagnosis of Lyme disease, it's like, yes, I can take antibiotics, I can get well, but it didn't work. And, you know, the antibiotics just made me sicker. So I, that's when I really was pushed to look for alternatives. And I, by then I had changed my diet. I'd given up night call. I was working on my sleep, but that stayed disrupted for years. But you know, I just wasn't getting there. And I read about an herbal protocol for chronic Lyme disease that involved herbs that I really wasn't familiar with. There, there aren't things that you typically find like in a health food store or grocery store shelf, um, herbs with recognized antimicrobial properties. And I, you know, I, I was desperate. Um, so I took literally handfuls of capsules every day and over a three-month period, I started noticing a difference. And my total recovery was about three to five years. But you have to understand, I had bad heart involvement, um, brain involvement. My joints were falling apart. My GI tract was a mess. I mean, literally everything in my body was falling apart. And I got my health back. Um, but not only did I get my health back, you know, I continued taking the herbs and over the decade that's transpired since that time, now more than a decade, my health has been much better than average. And things that I didn't expect to clear up, like I was diagnosed with essential hypertension when I was in my 30s, in my 40s, my cholesterol was going up and my blood sugar was going up. And, you know, changing my diet helped, but taking herbs for 15 years my blood pressure is totally normal all the time. 
my capacity for exercise at age 50, 65 is much better than average, probably better than when I was in my 50s. That's incredible. So, you know, <laughs> just really this remarkable transformation. So that really, it was like a wake up call to say, pay attention to this thing, you know, what, understand what it is. So at first I went back and studied tradition, herbal traditions, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine. It's kind of like, yeah, we've got to start at the roots. And I did, but for me, it was speaking a different language. You know, all of those things were pre-science and pre-understanding things at a biochemical or cellular level. So I needed to think in more in Western science terms. So mm -hmm. there, fortunately, there's been an explosion of research over the past 20 years uh, on the science of herbs, you know, what the chemistry of the herbs is doing and how that's affecting our cells and our physiology. So I came around to understanding herbs very differently than a classical trained herbalist and looking at them more of how they're actually functioning inside what they're doing how they're different than drugs and it's been pretty exciting it, yeah, it's, it's quite exciting. a journey and I feel like it's so relevant these days because I feel like well I mean obviously I, I'm sure you know everyone is experiencing burnout these days or so it feels like I mean it feels yeah. like that's why you know if COVID taught us anything it's that we are all just like this hustle culture that we live in it just doesn't really give time to focus on your health in the way that you know like stress is telling us something and we're not all listening to it. Yeah. Um, and we look for these quick fixes, which, you know, don't really solve the underlying problems, which can lead to, yep. you know, a range of health issues. Um, in your book, you had mentioned that five factors that promote illness. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those and, and, and how we can kind of start addressing those, those five um, factors. Sure. Right? Yeah. Well, it, you know, it went back to asking that, que asking questions differently. You know, so when someone becomes ill in any way, they go to the doctor, right? And, you know, we put our faith in the physician to the, the healthcare provider to make us well. And so what that provider does is define the diagnosis, right? So everybody's been through this at some level or is at least aware of it. You know, so you collect the person's symptoms, do a physical exam, get labs or other diagnostic information to arrive at the diagnosis. And we want that diagnosis because that defines the pre-treatment protocol. And treatment protocol is typically drugs or surgery. So when we look at chronic illness, what the drugs are doing is blocking the manifestations of illness. So we're artificially blocking uh, abnormal pathways or uh, that might promote symptoms or, um, you know, the other progression of the disease. But it doesn't necessarily result in wellness. You know, people that become chronically ill typically don't get well. They typically end up on medications to manage their illness. And it, we might be able to achieve a state that they can go about life, but they're not well. Right. I started asking the question, you know, as I was applying this information to myself and to my patients, why did that person become ill? What's going on in their lives that, because, you know, I think 30 years ago when I was in medical school, everybody just assumed illness just kind of falls out of the sky and blops you on the head and you're unlucky if you get it. And now with a population that 60% of our population is defined as being chronically ill, that's a lot of people that are just by chance getting ill. So you have to ask that question why does a person get ill? And, and that's what's missing in our entire healthcare system. We do it on a basic level for uh, acute th type things like heart attack, somebody breaks their leg, something like that. You know, we're looking for that, that thing. But when you look at chronic illness, when somebody was like me, their whole body was breaking down, we don't do that. We move more toward, well, let's do the diagnosis and let's see what we can, what drugs we can use to slow this thing down. Mm -hmm. But when you ask that question, what causes chronic illness? There's a lot of good information and logically these things uh, come, come, to, uh, come to fruition that 
you know, if you ask that question and start searching for possible things that make people ill, I was able to arrive at uh, 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 only five categories of things that actually make people ill. Um, that seems pretty small, but because these things affect people different ways and can kind of fold together in different ways, we end up with a lot of different illnesses. When you take it down to the cellular level, which we can do and as we go along, um, that gets more specific on why certain people become ill with certain illnesses. But basically the level, the categories are what we eat, our food, you know, and we look at our food supply and it is hugely unnatural for compared to what humans are supposed to eat or have been eating for several hundred thousand years. These high carbohydrates, grain and meat based diets are really wrecking havoc on our systems and especially on our cells. Our cells just aren't designed for that. Uh, toxic environment. Um, over the past 10, 10 to 100 years, we've seen an unprecedented number of unnatural chemicals enter the environment, chiefly from use of petroleum and mm -hmm. coal. Um, right. So these things aren't supposed to be there. They've never been there. We don't really have good ability to process them. And they inhibit cellular functions. They make us sick. Um, chronic stress. You know, we are always basically running from the tiger, you know. I mean, we are... Con, con, we have schedules, deadlines, appointments, and we're all pushing the needle uh, everywhere you look. But beyond that, you know, we watch uh, uh, stimulating television till 10 or 11 o'clock at night and then expect to turn that off and get a good night's sleep. And we stay up on the computer and we do our cell phones. And, you know, so we're constantly being bombarded with stimulation that's unnatural. And that affects, that puts us in this fight or flight mode all the time, which disrupts our hormones and it disrupts sleep. And, you know, sleep is just so critical. Um, and exercise, we're not doing it. Um, we all need exercise. It normalizes hormones. It is important for blood flow. That is the first step in detoxifying your body is moving blood through mm -hmm. exercise. Really important. We're not doing that. Um, and then finally, microbes, that's a big factor. You know, we, we've, we're, we're focused a lot more on microbes with COVID and long COVID and all of these things. But the fact of the matter is we're being assaulted every minute of every day. There are microbes entering our system that we don't know about. Microbes that bacteria regularly cross from our gut, from our gums, from our sinuses, from our skin, into our bloodstream and end up in our tissues inside of our cells. And they're referring to this as the dormant microbiome. You know, we hear about the gut microbiome and our skin microbiome, and it turns out that we actually have bacteria, viruses that stay dormant inside of our cells through our entire lives. And you eat a bad diet, stay chronically stressed, expose yourself to toxic substances and don't get exercise. Those things come out. And I have to say that was the scariest part of reading your book, reading about reading reading about the microbes actually, and that the fact that they can live dormant for so long and just we're walking around and not even knowing about it. It's a big deal, and there's a lot of research that's coming available in the past ten has come available in the past ten years and is ongoing, documenting this idea that we actually do have bacteria and viruses and protozoa that stay dormant inside of our cells, in our brain, in our heart, throughout our body. Um, research showing that the placenta is not sterile. The placenta actually has a microbiome along with amniotic fluid. We are actually, a, 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 a mother is passing along her microbiome to her, her, her infant before that delivery, all through the, the process of the pregnancy. And those, those ideas are brand new. And you, they're, they're not making it to mainstream medicine because we don't really have anything to treat it or deal with it with for. Right. And so much of the other thing, other things as well that you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, are also really alarming because it's a, such a societal issue in some sense, like the way we work 
Right. You know, you can't, we can't just necessarily drop out. Most people can't. And the environment is what it is. I mean, you can choose to live in a place that, you know, it's more natural or what have you, but like in a lot of senses, even living in rural America, I mean, is that sometimes that's more toxic than living in a city if you're, you know, yeah, in terms is. of pesticides and things like that. So, yes, so you know, it, it's, uh, I've, I've done a lot of consults, um, uh, you know, several thousand consults, more like a high level of health coaching. And, you know, I talk to people in rural areas. And the first question that I ask is, are you surrounded by farmland? You know, we get the picture that, oh, people are in a rural area. They've got great air. Everything is wholesome there. And I find that so many people are surrounded by fields where they're spraying pesticides all the time. And I have had many people say, yeah, I can tell when they're spraying the pesticides because I feel terrible. Right. Um, so yeah, it's everywhere. It is. And I think that's part of the reason I think people get so overwhelmed. It's like, you feel like there's only so many things in your control, but um, can you tell us some of the ways that herbs can help our cells function properly? Like, like right. obviously that is something that's within our control. It's something that we can do for our health. And, right. Yeah. Um, but for us, those of us that don't really understand how it works, I mean, I'm, you know, you're always right. hearing, oh, take ashwagandha, take this, take that. And you're just like, okay, but how is it really working? <laughs> like, what can it do? Yeah. So that requires taking things down to a cellular level, you know, looking at these things. So we are a collection of cells. We tend to think about our body as a whole or think about body and compartments. You know, you look at our medical system, we divide it up into cardiology and pulmonology and rheumatology. And, you know, and we think of it as a whole, kind of like we would be, you know, we're working on a car that's broken. But the smallest functional unit in the body is a living cell. The living cell is the most basic functional unit for all of life. So our body is a collection of trillions of cells. We have uh, several thousand uh, or several hundred types of cells in the body. Every cell has a job. Every cell has purpose. And different cells are doing different jobs. You know, um, heart muscle cells are pumping blood. Uh, thyroid cells are producing thyroid hormone. Um, brain cells are firing impulses. So every cell in the body has purpose. Everything that happens in the body is a function of cellular functions. Mm -hmm. So cells working is really important. If we are healthy, it's because all of our cells are healthy. If we have symptoms of any kind, it's a reflection the cells in the body have been stressed. You know, we don't think about it that way, but like when when <clears throat> someone has a heart attack and a vessel is a coronary vessel is blocked off <clears throat> in their heart, the blood flow is stopped to the cells in the heart. So the muscle cells don't get oxygen or nutrients and they start to become stressed. So two things happen. They release chemicals that let the brain know that something's wrong so that, um, you know, so, so that we can act on it, but also those cells lose their function. They can't do their job. So any, any symptom that you have is a reflection of cells being stressed. And we don't think about it that way, but it's really important when you define what illness is. So symptoms come and go because our cells have the ability to repair any internal damage and regenerate new cells. So a lot of times symptoms that we have just get better on their own. And what that is, is healing. So what the healing process is, is the ability of cells to repair and regenerate in the body. So when we have chronic illness, it means that some kind of stress is ongoing that isn't allowing those cells to recover and repair because every cell in your body is working for you. It's working to uh, make your body work the best, to, to try to coordinate all of those functions and all those cells so that you feel well. So your cells are always working for you. And if you have chronic symptoms, or if that adds up to a chronic illness, what it means is your cells are chronically stressed. And we look back at these factors, you know, are you nourishing your cells? Well, a huge number of, you know, of our American population are eating a food that's just not designed for our cells. 
and we're basically choking ourselves with with the wrong kinds of nutrients and excessive carbohydrates all those toxins that we're exposed to chronically inhibit cellular functions and inhibit messaging. So what hormones do is basically it's cells talking to one another. Cells have to work together for us to work as a unit. So a lot of form, a lot of toxic substances actually disrupt hormones, disrupt communications in the body. So cells can't work together. Things start breaking down. And when we become stressed, when we're pushing that stress button all the time, that disrupts hormones, but it also takes away downtime. So cells need downtime to recover from being stressed. So if we're not sleeping or if we're pushing that alert button all the time, cells don't have that recovery time. So you're chronically working with cells that are overworked and can't function like they should. Exercise is really important to enhance blood flow. Blood flow delivers nutrients to cells, but it also pulls away toxins. It's a really important step in detoxification that a lot of people aren't taking advantage of. And the microbes there, well, they're just always there waiting. So when you look at herbs, we classically think of herbs like we think of drugs, you know, that we have a symptom, we take these herbs to relieve that symptom. And that's classically how we've been doing things for thousands of years, because most of herbal medicine has been observational. You know, someone has these symptoms, well, we know this herb can help those symptoms. And we apply that same principle to our conventional medical system, except we're using drugs. Herbs and drugs are, are working very, very differently, though. So what you're doing with an herb, uh, <clears throat> what you're doing with a drug is blocking that, that, that sense of a symptom. In other words, you're blocking the, the transmission of those distressed cells to your brain so you don't feel the symptom. And you're blocking some of those abnormal processes that are going on of cells in distress. But because you're not addressing the stress factors, you're not making people well. And that's a real problem in our whole healthcare system. So when you look at drugs and herbs, uh, most of the herbs that I'm talking about work by neutralizing stress factors. This is really important. Drugs can't do that. Herbs can do that. So when you look at plants, all plants are living organisms. They have to protect their cells from toxic substances, free radicals, uh, microbes of every variety. So plants are producing this robust chemistry of a protective chemicals that we call phytochemicals to protect the plant's cells from all the kinds of stress vectors that occur in the environment. So they do an excellent job at that. Now we have built-in mechanisms, but if we're having symptoms or are chronically ill, our mechanisms for cellular protection are overwhelmed. So when we take an herb, basically we're taking in those, that plant's defense system against free radicals, against radiation, against microbes of every variety, against all these different stress factors. So we are reducing the environment of stress that is, is causing our cells to, to not be able to function properly. So when you reduce cellular stress, cells can recover right. and they can rebound. So what we're also getting with the herb is chemical messengers that help balance stress hormones and other chemical messengers that have been disrupted by stressful situations. So when we take an herb, we're getting all this wonderful cellular protection that are allowing our cells to recover, which is the functional, which is the foundation of healing. So in a way, drugs don't promote healing. Drugs inhibit symptoms and, and, and slow processes, but they don't inhibit cellular stress and therefore they don't promote healing. Herbs inhibit cellular stress, counteract all of these stress factors, including um, some of the harmful effects of eating a high carbohydrate diet. So when you look at all these protective factors, the herbs are protecting us against every single stress factor 
including that wide spectrum of, of microbes that we're all exposed to. And that allows cells to recover, which is what healing is all about. So drugs don't directly promote healing. Herbs do directly promote healing. And that's really important. And that means they can work together. Right. Um, so there's there's been so much talk about like adaptogens, like herbs that are adaptogens. Can you explain a little bit about, because it sounds almost like you're saying that most herbs are have adaptogenic properties. Is that the case or am I misunderstanding that? No, it's true. Yeah. So one thing that I, I want to make clear in the book, um, you know, I talk about an herbal spectrum and it's, it's true. You know, when you look, when, when you say that word herb, it's a pretty broad spectrum of things all the way from, from our culinary herbs that we use in our food to herbs that do have drug like properties. So I'm talking mainly about my focus of interest is in on herbs that mainly have these protective properties. And adaptogens are a really good example of that. So adaptogens are herbs that have an overall uh, protective effect and promote healing. They don't have drug-like effects or, or a high level of toxicity, you know, so you can take them every day. And one of the things that, that classifies an herb in particular as an adaptogen is they neutralize stress hormones. By doing these things, they also protect organ systems, they enhance immune functions. So they do a lot of things by doing these basic protection, we got to get a lot of beneficial effects. But there are a lot of good herbs out there that aren't necessarily adaptogens. And the thing that separates um, an adaptogen, say like ashwagandha or ginseng, mm -hmm. and an herb like turmeric, which has many wonderful anti-inflammatory protective properties, but isn't considered an adaptogen, is that the adaptogens balance stress hormones. Okay. So turmeric doesn't do that very much. It's mainly anti-inflammatory, where some other herbs that we classify as adaptogens do do that. But even if you look at an herb that has some drug-like properties, like St. John's wort, Mm -hmm. uh, St. John's wort has chemicals in it that act very much like um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac and Zol Zoloft. It's doing exactly the same thing, but the drug is just doing that. Whereas St. John's wort has all of these other protective properties. So it's, it is offering that level of cellular protection that you're not going to find in a drug. So every herb, Every full spectrum herb that has a full extract of all the chemical components of the plant is going to offer that cellular protection, even if it has chemical substances in it that give it more drug-like properties. Got it. That's so fascinating because I do feel like there's so much confusion about drugs. Yeah. Or not the drugs, but the herbs. And, you know, I think there's also... Um, this fear about like, you know, what herbs are safe to take as well. Can you talk a little bit about like how we know that the herbs that we're taking are safe, like especially in dose, dosing, like, I feel like there's so much confusion about like the right, the proper dosage. I mean, if you're, it also depends on the person, I would imagine person's right. weight, a person, you know, male, female, like what, what role do, do those factors play in when you're taking herbs and, and safety factors and such? Yeah, well, it, it's, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book is just to clear up a lot of these things and help people on that journey. So what I try to get people to do is, you know, learn like uh, a half dozen or a dozen or even a couple of dozen herbs. Just start with some basic ones because so many herbs are doing similar things, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's interesting as I started studying herbs, we have herbal traditions in China, India, the United States, North America, Europe, everywhere, South America. Um, and I found that there are a lot of commonalities and related species of plants all over the world. Um, interestingly, one of my favorite adaptogens is rhodiola from Siberia, and it turns out that a uh, close relative, almost identical species grows naturally in the Appalachian Mountains of North, North America. Um, 
So when you look around the world, you find that a lot of things around you, wherever you are, have these protective medicinal properties. So, and there are, and plants all over the world have relatives, you know, you probably have cat briar that is in your backyard growing. If you have any kind of uh, uh, bushes or foliage, there's probably some cat briar growing in there. Well, that's a species of Smilax. It's a wonderful medicinal and there's species all over the world and most of them are medicinal. Um, and it is actually one of the species that uh, plants that we use um, for chronic Lyme disease because it has some really wonderful immune modulating and antimicrobial properties. So everywhere around you, there are plants that are helpful. Um, there are also plants that are poisons, though. And so, yes, you do have to be aware of that. You know, it's like um, uh, poison ivy has some wonderful antimicrobial and protective substances, but it protects itself with oils and chemicals that are really, you know, nobody would make the, the mistake of eating poison ivy twice. <laughs> so there are some plants out there that are threatening. Um, as I've learned, though, uh, through time, there are a lot more protective beneficial plants than there are poisonous plants. But, you know, before you go out in the woods collecting, you yeah, know what you're looking for. Be really well, I have to say you do a great job in the book of kind of breaking it down, like which ones are safer. Yeah. Than so, <laughs> so it does make it but, very easy. You know, to most of the things are pretty good. And when you look at protective properties as opposed to drug like properties, the dose range is a lot wider than you would think. Um, the toxic dose for most herbs that I use is thousands and thousands of capsules a day. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's crazy how truly safe they are. Not to say that you know people can have odd allergic reactions, but most people tolerate most herbs quite well. Okay. Um, Dose range, the, the, the important thing is getting enough in you. And I find that what most people are doing is not getting enough of the phytochemistry of the plant in their system. And there are also, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I need to be cautious. I'll take just one herb. And, you know, there's a, there's a, we have a history of using blends in herbal medicine because what you find is when you combine different herbs together, you compound their benefits. You get a lot more benefits. So most herbal formulas have five or more herbs per that, that you would take together to get that wonderful synergy. So there are, there are a lot of ways that you can get that. And I talk about that in the book. Um, but getting a good quality product, you know, if you're not paying very much for the product, you're probably not getting much of the phytochemistry. So if you go to a health food store and you're buying a, an herb, um, uh, say rhodiola, um, and you're paying about 12, 12 or 15 bucks for a bottle of herb, you're probably getting a whole herb powder. So if you're getting capsules, so what it is is they basically take the plant, dry it, crush it up into a powder and put it in capsules. And what you're getting is mainly fiber. There's not much chemistry in there. You're just getting the plant parts. So the next kind of preparation that, that you can use is what's called a tincture. Um, and not to exclude, you know, teas and things like that. I think they're all great, but you're not necessarily getting the full spectrum of all of uh, everything from the plant. So a tincture, they take up the plant parts, whether that's the roots or the, the, the flowers, stems, leaves, whatever is the most beneficial for that plant and soak it in water and alcohol. And the water and alcohol pulls off both the aqueous and the fat-based chemicals out of the plant. So you get that full spectrum. And the more plant you put per uh, water and alcohol, the more concentrated it gets. So that's done, they pull the plant parts out. So you're getting rid of all the fiber. So you're taking it as a tincture. The downside of the tincture is you tend to get a lot of alcohol to use the amount that you need to get the phytochemistry to do the most benefit. And a lot of your herbs are bitter, um, so it's not necessarily pleasant to take them. I take a lot of tinctures, but a lot of people find them to be too bitter and uncomfortable. But it sounds like it's one of the best ways to get the full plant. It is a good way, but what we use in all of our products are what are called standardized 
powdered extracts. So what that is, is they take the water alcohol tincture, spray it on a surface, collect and dry off the water and alcohol and collect the powder, which is that pure phytochemistry. So you're not getting any fiber from the plant, you're getting just the phytochemicals. And that goes into a capsule. And one capsule can be equal to one or two teaspoons of a tincture. So, so you're really getting a lot. And that's what I used in my recovery. And that's what we do for most of our products because it's just simple. Um, not to say people shouldn't take tinctures. And again, I use them. But if you really want to get enough in you to do something in an easy way, the capsules are hard to beat. Um, right. You know, three or four capsules for someone who is healthy, that can give you an awful lot of cellular protection. And they're so easy to take. It's like, and they're easy to take. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me like the top herbs that you recommend? Like if people are going to st just starting on their herb journey, um, what are maybe five or so that are really sure. like the most beneficial or easy access or, you know? Yeah, sure. It's, it, this is a question that I'm often asked and I, and I answer to say, you know, there are a lot of choices out there mm -hmm. and I have my list that I just arrived at over time looking at how do we cover all the bases for protecting our brain, our heart, our vascular system, you know, our entire, entire system, um, because some herbs offer a little better protection for certain types of cells, you, you know, that that some, some the, the chemical components of some herbs may be better for protecting the vascular system, where some others are better for protecting joints and muscle. Um, so when you combine various herbs, you can get this really wonderful effect of protecting everything in the body um, without having side effects, without really, uh, you know, not feeling a drug-like effect, um, just boosting those internal defenses. So uh, rhodiola, we mentioned, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's always on my list. I like that herb. It's, it is an adaptogen. Um, it increases oxygenation of tissues. Um, it balances immune system functions. It balances stress hormones, uh, protects organs, protects muscles, joints, uh, et cetera. Um, it's really, really nice herb. Um, you know, and, and you, you look at the herb and go, okay, can, you know, can, can we help? Can we understand a little bit about the herb from where it comes from? Because, thinking about herbs in the point of, of protection and phytochemistry, different herbs have different properties because different herbs have different stress factors in their environment. So rhodiola is from Siberia. It's a cold, harsh environment, not as much microbe stress. So it's not as good a my antimicrobial as others. So it does have some documented properties but it's really good for protecting us, protecting cells against that harsh environment. Um, so it's really good for helping us adapt to physical and mental stresses. Um, one of the top herbs for that. Um, it was one of the original adaptogens. There were five original adaptogens and it was on the list. Um, now that's been expanded to dozens of them, but it was one of the originals. Um, second on the list is reishi mushroom. Um, so not all herbs are plants. Our medicinal mushrooms have very similar properties. And reishi, if you go walking in the woods and see a mushroom growing on the side of the tree that looks kind of like a fan with kind of a rust colored pattern in it, that's a reishi. So they're different species that grow all over the world. We know the most about the species from Asia. That's the one that's been the most studied. In Japan, they found that it has some of the most potent anti-cancer substances on the planet. But it is considered adaptogen, so it, it's another one that helps balance stress hormones. It's a great immune modulator. It balances immune system functions that if your immune system is too revved up, it'll cool it down. If it's not revved up enough, it'll, it'll uh, stimulate it a bit. Um, so it's something you can take every day to help a balance immune system function. Has some really nice antiviral properties. 
um, and very good for protecting the liver, protecting heart um, and, and organ systems. So a, a really nice herb. Uh, turmeric, everybody knows that one from India. Um, it is the yellow in curry, and it has some wonderful anti-inflammatory properties. It's, again, not considered an adaptogen, but it's protecting the vascular system um, and joints and, and brain functions. Um, you know, we've, it is thought that one of the reasons in India they have such a low rate of cancer and Alzheimer's is because most of the population is eating around a gram of turmeric every day in their curry. So that really wonderful protective effect. Um, That's one I actually cola. take myself. I feel like I put it on everything these days. So Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. Um, Go-to cola is, uh, at, but, you know, just an example of how things work in synergy. Um, all the curries in India have black pepper, which adds to the but it in, actually increases absorption of the chemicals in turmeric called polyphenols mm -hmm. by a factor of up to a thousand. So there are different ways that you can enhance absorption of these various chemicals by using other herbs. So that's part of that synergy that is so important. Um, Go-to cola is another one from India, uh, revered through time for protecting brain functions. Um, it also has anti-diabetic properties, um, so protects the brain primarily. Um, milk thistle is really wonderful for protecting our liver. Um, you know, as we go through time, especially in our toxic world, we're constantly dinging off our liver cells. 25% of the population has something called fatty liver, where they've replaced their liver cells with fat cells. So as you go through time, you become less able to process toxins, but you also become less able to process cholesterol. So one of the reasons our cholesterol gradually goes up over time is because we're losing liver cells, which are important for processing um, and reusing cholesterol so our blood levels go up. Is Very that, interestingly, is they, pardon? Is that, does, does alcohol play a role in that? I feel like it does. Breaking yeah. society. I feel yeah. like when you think of the liver, you're thinking. And not to say that, um, you know, taking milk thistle allows you to, to uh, <laughs> drink more, but <clears throat> it is something that you should be doing. Um, and taking milk thistle for 15 years, uh, milk thistle is known to promote regeneration of liver cells. And my cholesterol has actually gone down since my 40s instead of going up like it's supposed to. Um, and I don't take any drugs for cholesterol. That's great. Um, yeah. So uh, that, that's one. Um, other herbs, hawthorn is great for the heart. Um, uh, maritime pine bark, barks of trees have a lot of protective chemicals in them. Um, so maritime pine bark is wonderful for the vascular system. And then one that I add to my regiments just of daily protective herbs is one called shilajit. Um, probably you haven't heard of that one. It's an interesting substance and I put it in there for a very specific purpose. So shilajit is plant substances that have been fermented in soil, decaying plant substances that are fermented in soil and then ooze, uh, ooze out around rocks in the Himalayas. And it's been used for thousands and thousands of years as something to promote vitality. And what it has in it is something we're not getting from herbs and not getting from our food anymore. And those are chemicals called fulvic acid and humic acid that are created when plant material is fermented by soil bacteria. It's important because when you think about it, for hundreds of thousands of years, we ate on the ground and our food had a lot of soil and bacteria in it mm -hmm. because we were eating things around roots. And, you know, so when we were foraging, we were getting a lot of those substances. We're not getting that anymore. So fulvic acid and humic acid have found to be really important for vitality, for intestinal functions, for um, hormonal and 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 uh, and uh, sexual functions. So 
all of these things are really important for how our physiology works and we're not getting them. So a really pure form of shilajit, I think, is an important addition to an everyday regimen because it fills in the blanks of things we're not getting from our herbs and not getting from our food anymore. So that's my basic regimen of everyday herbs. And oh, I so think they're super important if you can, you know, well, we have a product that has all of those in there, of course, but there, there are probably others that do too, but those are right. some of my favorites. That's, that's, yeah, I love that because I do feel like there's been talk recently about how the importance of healthy soil and things like that. And probably, you know, a lot of our soil is not healthy anymore. It's just been right. over farmed yeah. what have you. And I don't think a lot of people have, I've never heard of shilajit before in your book. So well, you have to be careful where, you know, it, it's like all herbs, sourcing them is really important. So um, we do a lot of testing to make sure that our that herbs are free of heavy metals, pesticides, other kinds of chemicals. And that's especially true with shilajit. You know, we're we are using a highly purified version that has been vetted with various levels of testing to make sure that, you know, it, it's clean um, because you're not guaranteed that just buying herbs off the shelf. You know, you don't really know what you're getting. So it's important to work with a company that does the various levels of testing that should be done. There are a lot of great companies out there for sure. Right. Well, and it's interesting because I feel like we've all also heard the claims, you know, with taking vitamins and supplements and you just never really know what you're getting or if, you know, if you're getting anything or if anything that's actually going to work. So I feel like there's just this tendency to think that if you just pop a pill, you're going to be healthy. And, you know, it's like, oh, I'm not eating healthy, but I take a vitamin. So now I'm good. And, you know, I think yeah. a lot of people have that mindset. You, you know, I think we all want to do something positive for our health. And, we want to do easy things and taking a vitamin pill is easy. So we do right. that. And, you know, I'm trying to make a case for the fact that, yeah, you're probably a lot better off taking a, an herbal supplement like the herbs that I just mentioned than you are your, your vitamins. And that's a, that's something that I like to distinguish between that herbs and vitamins are two very different things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people tend to put those things together, but what vitamins are, are nutrients. So all cells need nutrients to function. You know, you can think of cells as like a, a tiny little machine and it, it needs to generate energy, but it needs raw materials to do whatever its job is. So that's what vitamins are doing. They, they're important for, gener for that generating ener process, the energy generation process in mitochondria and for raw materials just for, or for, for our cells to do what they need to do. Um, but a cell only needs so much nutrient, right? So it only needs so much carbohydrate, so much fat, and so much vitamins. And it needs to kind of pull those continually as it needs them. So good blood flow, regular exercise, and eating a great diet is where you're going to pull most of those nutrients. Now, taking a multivitamin probably doesn't do a lot of harm, especially if you're taking a good quality multivitamin. But think about it. You're giving one load once a day and load, just bombarding your cells with all these nutrients. Well, they, the cells can't use them that, that quickly. So right. a lot of times they just float around and they don't do anything. Um, so our multivitamins, there's really not a whole lot of evidence that they're doing a lot of benefit little bit marginal, but not that much. So what we're doing with the herb is something completely different. <clears throat> Herbs are non-nutritive. They're not a good source of vitamins, carbohydrates, fats, anything that our cells need. They're purely protective. They're protecting our cells from stress. And what's interesting is when you look at that concept of, of you know, illness being associated with cellular stress, when cells are stressed, they're working harder, they need more nutrients. So the demand is greater. But when, when you look at what the phytochemicals are doing, they're protecting and reducing cellular stress. So if you're reducing cellular stress, demands for nutrients go down. So even though herbs aren't a source of nutrients, they, they decrease demand for nutrients. So they're almost better than a multivitamin in a lot of ways. 
Right. That totally makes sense. Um, we're getting close to running out of time, but I wanted to ask you about the medical establishment and why there's such a reluctance um, to recommend herbs. I mean, I'm assuming most of it is just a lack of knowledge and not having the education yeah. and not having right. the medical, I mean, the industry basically healthcare in general, like, I mean, obviously it takes away from pharmaceuticals, which I'm sure is a, is a big issue, but um, what are some of the ways that that average people can can kind of advocate for themselves and 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 where do they, can they go to for information and to learn more if they want if they want to be more educated i mean in addition to reading your book obviously yeah it, you know i i do a lot of writing um a, outside the book and you know my mission is to educate people about this different way of looking at herbs and why it could be so important in our society um, as far as our, you know, our medical establishment, anytime you have an established norm, it's very, very hard to break that. Mm -hmm. And this has been ongoing for a long time. I mean, I'm, I'm actually fourth generation physician in my family. And, and, you know, looking back, um, my great, great grandfather probably did use herbs in his practice, and he's been long gone. And I don't know that to be a fact, but it's very likely. But in the in the late 30s, um, the AMA, in an attempt to standardize medicine, defined that if you wanted to be a licensed physician, you would only use drugs and surgery in your practice. And that pretty much cut herbs out completely or any other kinds of natural things. And the problem is that herbs aren't standardized. They don't need to be standardized because the toxicity is so much less where if you're talking about a drug, all drugs are basically therapeutically dosed poisons, you know, and even over the counter drugs like, uh, like acetaminophen, Tylenol, ibuprofen, things like that. You take a whole bottle of that stuff and it can kill you. Right. So you have to really regulate that, that dose. So drugs could be more easily standardized and regulated. They wanted physicians all over the country and, you know, New York, San Francisco, rural North Carolina, everybody using exactly the same thing. And they couldn't standardize herbal therapy or other kinds of natural therapy. So they basically, because they didn't understand it, they cut it out. Mm -hmm. And so our drug therapies through the early and late 20th century we did some pretty remarkable things. You know, in, in the 40s, we came up with uh, penicillin, the first antibiotic. We started using vaccines. There were drugs that for acute intervention and reducing symptoms were fabulous. But as we have gravitated because of, you know, because of all these factors that have evolved um, that, are, that are disrupting health, we've evolved now to treating chronic illness. So chronic drugs for chronic illness really don't make people well. So is there's been this evolution from acute intervention to managing chronic illness, and we just don't do a very good job of it, but it's so ingrained, it's hard to change it. And, you know, herbal therapy, natural therapies, dietary, nutritional therapies, all of these things, they're just not taught in medical school. And I think it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's time to rearrange what we're doing, um, but that's, that's going to take a lot of effort. So right. the fact of the matter is good health is really in people's hands. You know, it's um, when you look at illness from the point of view of cause rather than the point of view of diagnosis, so much of that is available to us. We can change our diet. You know, you can use air filters in your home and filter your water and eat clean food and manage your stress better and get out and walk around the block two or three times a day and take herbs every day. So, so many things we could, we could prevent most chronic illness that's occurring. I feel very strongly at that. Absolutely. Are there, are, just since you come from the medical establishment as well, are there some ways that individuals can really maximize our access to healthcare, even when our doctors don't understand, you know, are there ways that we can, you know, ensure we're getting the best healthcare, the questions that we're asking, or, you know, how do we take ownership, you know, of our own health, even within 
that realm with when you're going for your annual checkup, you know, are there questions we should be sure. asking? Are there things we should be pushing back on? And, you know. Well, I, I think the important thing to know is that you have the last word always, you know, and I said this many times, our healthcare system isn't broken as much as we're asking it to do things that it's not designed to do. So our entire system has been, has evolved to do acute intervention. And we do an exceptional good job at acute intervention. You know, you have a heart attack, break your leg, have an automobile accident. You're going to get the best care in the world from modern medicine. But we, we apply that acute intervention to managing chronic illness, and it just doesn't work. So I think we need to get away from that. I think we need to do more prevention. So, so much of good health comes from outside a doctor's office. So yeah, we do need those periodic physicals. That basic blood work that you get is valuable for certain kinds of things and having access to the system in case you do have something terrible happen, I think is very, very important. But the issue that I have is people aren't becoming proactive about their health. You know, it's um, when I was writing the book, I came upon an article uh, published in a medical journal about overcoming chronic illness. And their bottom line conclusion was 90% of overcoming any chronic illness is self-care. In other words, it's what you eat. It's how you go about life. It's your stress level and whether you're sleeping and whether you're moving. And, and so as we, you know, if we move more toward a society that we're more cognizant of those choices, I think that we could really expand our ability to reduce the incidence of chronic illness and enhance recovery when someone becomes chronically ill. Right. That that makes a lot of sense. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. This is so helpful. And for anyone that hasn't read their book yet, it's The Cellular Wellness Solution by Dr. Rawls. And um, yeah, and hopefully, you know, I would love to speak with you in the future on more articles about herbs because I feel like this is such an interesting topic to so many of our of our viewers. And so it thank is. you again for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.